coming up on lawmakers. Increasing lottery revenues caused some to question Hope scholarship cuts. State school superintendent Kathy Cox agrees to include the word evolution in the state's curriculum. And a coalition of nonprofit organizations rally to oppose proposed budget cuts to health care and social services. Those stories and more are coming up next. Live from Atlanta, this is Lawmakers for Thursday, February 5th. Here are your hosts, Gerald Bryant and Nwandi Lawson. Good evening, everyone. Also in tonight's broadcast, the Senate passes a bill that will allow residents of Sandy Springs to vote on incorporating as a city. And House Republicans encouraged the Senate to pass the Defense of Marriage Act. That resolution would amend Georgia's constitution to outlaw gay marriage. But our top story tonight, lottery revenues and the Hope Scholarship Program. State lottery ticket sales were up $71 million in the last half of 2003. Lieutenant Governor Mark Taylor is among those saying that's another reason not to eliminate student fees and books from the HOPE Scholarship. The HOPE Commission and Governor Sonny Perdue have recommended those measures as a way of keeping HOPE from running out of money. My plea is that the General Assembly will take a conservative approach to any changes to the HOPE Scholarship. Uh, there are funds available both from sales of lottery tickets this year and from a $250 million fully funded savings account that would prevent any necessity of cutting books and fees. Well, the governor's position is that, um, yes, revenue numbers are up. Yes, that is good news. However, we have no guarantee that it's going to remain that way. At the same time, we're looking at growing enrollment at state institutions. So there's really no guarantee that the cost of hope um, will not supersede revenues at some point. So it is the governor's position that right now we need to address the issue of hope solvency. And he endorses what the commission has put forward, and he's sticking by that. The Senate Higher Education Committee also discussed Georgia lottery revenues today. Collections show that lottery revenues have increased in the state, but there's also a projected increase in enrollment at Georgia colleges and universities, and that could put a greater demand on HOPE scholarship funds. Um, we know the lottery revenue is growing again this year, so we focused on that uh, new projection about what the lottery would do and looked at the numbers and uh, just tried to to decide if we needed to change what we're proposing and and you know it's just it's still you still have a problem and so we still need to do something to save some money the senate higher education committee took no vote on hope legislation today the house higher education committee also took one hope bill under consideration this afternoon house bill 1325 deals with scholarship eligibility no vote was taken on that legislation as either in other news, the Georgia Coalition United for a Responsible Budget, or CURB, held a press conference at the Capitol this morning to speak out against some of the proposed cuts to health and social services. David Zelsky joins us live from the Capitol with more on that story. David. Well, thanks, Gerald. Members of CURB called on Governor Sonny Perdue and Georgia legislators to restore funding for some of these critical programs for both the FY 2004 and 2005 budgets. Now that both my husband and I are working, I don't know where we would be with without peach care. Thank you. The coalition slogan is enough is enough and they have three areas where they want government to focus. Stop human services cuts that harm people, raise costs for communities and slow economic recovery. Second, recover lost revenue. And third, promote sound investments in a healthy Georgia. Let us not look back on this time and say that we couldn't feed and educate our children, that we couldn't provide health care for the sick and elderly, that we couldn't find a way to serve those most in need in our community. Times are hard. We can do better. Curb says these proposed cuts in Medicaid eligibility would eliminate coverage for over 83,000 low-income Georgians, 12,500 of them being children. A stand has been taken today by Curb because we know that the cuts that we're talking about is happening in real time to real people and is producing real pain. I know that times are tough, but as Bill Bolin said, we can do better. What legislators need to know is that Medicaid and Katie Beckett is not the end-all, beat-all. It does not cover all expenses. Curb provided a list of alternatives for finding money, such as collecting taxes owned by corporations and individuals and suspending some current tax exemptions. Reporting live, I'm David Zelsky for Lawmakers. Thank you very much, David. 
State School Superintendent Kathy Cox today repealed her proposal that the word evolution be removed from the biology standards in a new state curriculum. Although she canceled a press conference this morning, the superintendent issued this statement. I made the decision to remove the word evolution from the draft of the proposed biology curriculum in an effort to avoid controversy that would prevent people from reading the substance of the document itself. Instead, a greater controversy ensued. She goes on to say, I misjudged the situation and I want to apologize for that. I want you to know today that I will recommend to the teacher teams that the word evolution be put back into the curriculum. If adopted by the State Board of Education in May, the Georgia Performance Standards will replace Georgia's quality core curriculum, which has been in place since 1997. Meanwhile, the Senate Education Committee passed a bill today that will change the name of the Office of School Readiness to Bright from the Start, Georgia's Office of Early Care and Education. Senate Bill 456 transfers the regulation, licensure, and enforcement of early care and education programs from the Department of Human Resources to Bright from the Start. The office will also perform functions currently performed by the Georgia Child Care Council and serve as the Head Start State Collaboration Office. These changes will occur on October 1, 2004. The bill also states that Bright from the Start will be a separate budget unit and all persons employed by and positions authorized for Department of Human Resources will be transferred to that office. SB 456 now goes to the Senate Rules Committee. Well, tourism is the second largest industry in Georgia. It generates over $690 million annually, and today Governor Perdue announced his plan to increase that revenue. It was the first of three economic development announcements made by the governor today. Lawmaker's Jesse Freeman is live at the Capitol with more. Jesse. Well, thank you, Nwandi. This morning, Governor Perdue announced the formation of the Georgia Tourism Council. This council is a public and private partnership that will study ways to improve the tourism industry in the state. Then he made the trip up to Georgia Tech's new conference center, where he announced an executive order creating the Office of Entrepreneurship and Small Business Development. Georgia's small business failure rate is 16 percent. That's 6 percent worse than the national average. You remember that first instructor you had talked about the library and introducing you to where you go get knowledge and teaching you how to get it yourself. This is what we needed to be doing for our entrepreneurs and that's where we want to want to head in teaching them how to find and how to rise to their level of capacity. The office will create a web portal where small business owners can go to find advice and government resources. This site will provide one-stop access to small business resources and again helping to to coordinate those efforts. The governor then returned to the capital where he signed a letter of intent to cooperate with Premier Gary Dolor of the Canadian province of Manitoba on economic development. Now the two leaders did not mention specifics but both committed to designate senior staff members to the pursuit of joint initiatives. Reporting live for lawmakers, I'm Jesse Freeman. Thank you, Jesse. Now, Jesse, did the governor indicate what fields that they might be working in? Well, again, in one, he wasn't specific here, but the agreement gave the examples of the fields of life sciences and educational research. Well, that's great. Thanks so much, Jesse. And also today, the House Education Committee decided that a bill delaying implementation of the Georgia Academic Placement and Promotion Policy for third graders needs additional study in subcommittee. Sponsored by Committee Chair Bob Holmes, House Bill 1310 would prevent local systems from retaining next year third graders who do not meet the standards on this year's criterion referenced competency test. In other business, the committee gave a due pass to House Bill 1125, which would create an anti-bullying statute for students in kindergarten through 12th grade. That measure was amended to provide consequences for parents who submit false reports and to provide penalties for elementary school bullies who cannot be referred to alternative schools. The committee substitute to House Bill 1125 will now go to the House Rules Committee and await assignment to the full House. Meanwhile, the American Resistance Organization expresses their opposition to proposed legislation that could give undocumented uh, workers Georgia driver's licenses. Lawmakers Chrissy Thrasher joins us live from the Capitol with more on this story. Chrissy. Well, Gerald, the group says they are against allowing those they call illegal aliens to receive Georgia's driver's licenses. They say undocumented workers should not be allowed the privileges that come with having a license. The license acts as a national passport that gives its owner a legal identity. A license allows us to get a hotel room, open a bank account, board an airplane, rent a car, and so much more. And there's one other very important thing that a license 
can act as uh, identification for voter registration in many states, including right here in Georgia. But those supporting the legislation say allowing immigrants to have a valid Georgia's driver's license would not only give immigrants a chance to have auto insurance and be eligible to pay state taxes, but the legislation would serve another purpose as well. Representative Chuck Sims explains. In Georgia, with, a, with your driver's license, you have a both a picture ID and a fingerprint. Uh, that will help in identifying foreign nationals here and also gives a security measure if these folks happen to be uh, undesirables. Uh, then INS could be uh, contacted and, and these folks could be, you know, uh, looked at if, if they chose to, to get a license. And Representative Sims also pointed out that this proposal provides a way for undocumented workers to get a license but not require them to do so. Reporting live, I'm Chrissy Thrasher for Lawmakers. Chrissy, before you go, a question. If you're in this country illegally, can you currently receive a driver's license in Georgia? Well, according to Representative Sims, Georgia law currently does not allow undocumented workers to have a driver's license. Thank you very much, Chrissy. In other news, House Republicans want the state Senate to move quickly on the constitutional amendment banning gay marriage. That comes a day after a Massachusetts Supreme Court opinion on same-sex marriages. The Massachusetts court declared there was a state constitutional right for same-sex couples to marry and have all of the benefits which come from a marriage. These actions by the Massachusetts court represent an extreme example of judicial activism and legislating from the bench. Judges are elected to interpret laws, not make them. We legislators are elected to make laws. But ultimately, the power to make those laws is controlled by the Constitution and the people of this state. The Defense of Marriage Act, which would amend the state constitution to recognize marriages only between men and women, has not yet come before the Senate for a vote. Well, the House today agreed to amend the requirements for those who manage assets as guardians or conservators for children or incapacitated adults. Representative Mary Margaret Oliver said that over 150 state judges had worked to update the code. I'll tell you as a practical matter, the biggest trouble that the courts have is when the conservator doesn't file any reports. And then the court will have hearings, show cause hearings, why haven't you done what you're supposed to do, and will appoint somebody else most generally to take on the job. Amendments were introduced to grant immunity from lawsuits to guardian ad litems, presume joint custody by both biological parents, and extend the term minor to include unborn children. All of the amendments were defeated in House Bill 229 passed by a vote of 170 to 2. It now moves over to the Senate. The Senate today approved the Comprehensive State Water Management Planning Act. Senator Casey Cagle says controversial provisions in last year's version of the bill are gone. Last year, we, we moved uh, the water planning bill through the General Assembly, and there was various controversial pieces in that legislation. The issue of, of water um, permits, uh, the issue of interbasin transfers, all of those things that created concerns. And many senators, I think, were placed in a position of, of just not really knowing what the impact possibly would be for them in their Senate district. Um, and, 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 and basically, we've come back, all of that is out. There is, uh, to my knowledge, no controversy at all centered around this particular bill. Senator Robert Lamoud wanted to make sure that there would be no additional trading of water permits under the legislation. Senator Cagle assured him there would not be. The General Assembly, having said that they don't want this, have not passed anything that says you may not have water permitted. Uh, but doesn't this say that the EPD can do it unless we stop them oh, at a future no, date? No, no, I don't think you could interpret that that way at all, no. And every environmental uh, group uh, is, that should be on, your, on your, your desk there has endorsed this proposal, and as you are aware, that was a, you know, a huge issue to them, and they're all in favor of it. The Senate approved the conference committee report on House Bill 237 by a vote of 53 to 1. The House has yet to vote. 
The Senate also passed a bill that sponsors hope will remove unnecessary state regulations from small businesses. Senate Bill 361 would limit the figureability of agencies to create regulations that stifle businesses and cost consumers. SB 361 passed by substitute. The vote was 42 in favor, 12 against. It's headed to the House. Well, it's an issue that's been around the General Assembly for several years. Should Sandy Springs, a North Atlanta suburb, become a city? The state Senate voted today in favor of allowing the vote. Here's a brief look at today's debate. It is the local bill, or a local bill, that would provide for 86,000 residents in the area of Sandy Springs, unincorporated Fulton County, to have the opportunity to vote in a referendum as to whether or not they want to incorporate into a city of Sandy Springs. It is answering their call and their desire and their wish for self-determination. And the fact of the matter is, and I just confirmed this with the staff from the city of Atlanta, this bill, if passed, along with the, its companion piece, would mean that the city of Atlanta would lose $22 million in revenues. So the Senate votes 41 to 11 in favor of the Sandy Springs vote. Senate Bill 49 heads for the House. Well, Representative Billy Mitchell's proposal that only emergency personnel should be able to use electronic devices that disrupt traffic signal operation passed the House today. Representative Mitchell explained that the bill would prevent individual drivers from purchasing traffic control device preemption emitters on the Internet. Police and fire departments for years have used MIRT to clear intersections and stop opposing traffic on emergency runs. This is the proper and an intended use of this technology. But increasingly, it's being used today for the travel convenience of individual drivers. Some internet entrepreneurs are, are more interested in cash than in public safety have been offering this device over the internet for $300. And of course there are buyers because at the moment the commerce is legal. This bill supported by law enforcement all over the state will make its use, possession with the ability to use, sale or purchase illegal for anyone other than police, fire and other emergency personnel. Violation of the law would be a misdemeanor with penalties of up to one year in jail and or a fine of $1,000 or less. House Bill 1113 passed by a vote of 167 to 1. Members of the State Department of Transportation Board are normally elected by a secret ballot of legislators. That may be changing as the Senate votes to vote in public. Here's President Pro Tem Eric Johnson. What the bill would do was take away our ability to have a secret ballot on DOT board races. This is any, it's all that we can determine. This is the only secret ballot that we have in the General Assembly that involves policy, money, and, uh, and, and, the, and revenues. Other than caucus officers, which is, which is not affecting real policy, this is the only secret ballot we have. I believe it's time to remove that. I think it's in the best interest of the state of open government. The Senate voted 43 to 10 in favor of open voting for DOT board member Senate Bill 438 goes to the Georgia House. House Judiciary Chairman Tom Bordeaux called a special advisory committee meeting this afternoon to discuss civil justice reform legislation. House Speaker Pro Tem DuBose Porter presented several, seven different proposals, two dealing with expert witnesses, two with frivolous lawsuits, and three involving insurance reform. When you take a one comprehensive bill and uh, what happened last week? Does it go to this committee? You have everybody jumping on the whole thing. Why don't we try to partition this out by issue and selectively see what can help? Where you can make some, some tangible inroads to help in this whole issue of fairness, of balance, of, of all of that by using these bills as vehicles to get that discussion started. Members of the committee will split into separate working groups to fine tune each bill before they're dropped. The Senate Judiciary Committee this afternoon voted to protect young girls from the act of genital mutilation. Senate Bill 418 calls for penalties of from 1 to 20 years in prison for those who circumcise females under the age of 18. The bill also connects parents or those in custody of the child to the offense. They will fly somebody in and have somebody from Somalia fly in and basically perform it on a multitude of girls at one time. And so with that, the practitioner flies out, and so it's very difficult to get to, to 
to lock up the person that actually commits the injury per se and so you have to go with the person that held the child down the person that you know provided the and so it's really a party to a crime and I understand your concerns and yeah, it goes to child endangerment Senate Bill 418 was given a due pass by committee substitute and moves on to the Senate Rules Committee well, a bill that would help uniform roadway memorialization went before the Senate Special Judiciary this afternoon. House Bill 20, sponsored by Senator Ben Bridges, would increase each DUI fine by $1 to fund roadside side signs that would memorialize DUI victims. The signs would be erected by the Department of Transportation and would be left standing for five years. The Senate Special Judiciary also heard from Senator Faye Smith, who's sponsoring Senate Bill 457, which would build local coalitions to provide improved assistance to sexual assault victims. What we're trying to establish is a protocol in regard to the process that our community would go through building this committee in order to make sure that when someone comes forth, uh, a child, uh, an adult, uh, male or female, child that they are given the opportunity in a very safe kind of environment to be able to tell the circumstances that they are reporting regard to having been sexually assaulted. House Bill 20 and Senate Bill 457 both received due pass recommendations and move on to the Senate Rules Committee. Legislation that would prohibit activities commonly referred to as payday lending passed the House Banks and Banking Committee yesterday, but with a Senate substitute that received heavy opposition from some Republican committee members, David Zelsky has that story. They will fly somebody in and have somebody from Somalia fly in and basically perform it on a multitude of girls at one time. And so with that, the practitioner flies out. All right, obviously that was not the right tape. Again, this is legislation that would prohibit activities commonly referred to as payday lending. Let's pick up the story with David Zelsky. Okay, we do not have that story, so let's move ahead. Also yesterday, the House Committee on Children and Youth met at the Capitol to hear from the newly appointed Department Heads of Juvenile Justice and the Department of Family and Children's Services. Commissioner Albert Murray of Juvenile Justice spoke to the committee about his interest in both preventative and faith-based programs. I think the best dollar that we can spend here in the state of Georgia in terms of juvenile justice is the prevention dollar. There is room and more room for good faith-based programs. DFAC's Director Janet Oliva commented on her goal to stabilize the department's workforce and upcoming employment shifts. ...to try to strengthen um, our stability with our workforce by hiring and retaining a good, competent, and committed workforce. We are undergoing a reorganization of the state office. And in that reorganization, we are shifting positions from the state to the field because, as you know, the work is done in the field. And that is where the critical need is. Oliva also discussed plans to rewrite Georgia's Child Protective Services policy. Here's what she had to say. They have a piece of that that they have implemented, which is best practice. This, I don't think we found a state that has mastered it all, but we're pulling individual pieces from the various states. There are five states that we're looking at. Uh, Florida, Alabama, there, Illinois has an excellent system. Um, we're looking at Delaware and Arizona. And what we're doing is we are literally going to rewrite our Child Protective Services policy. Oliva added that she is looking forward to working collaboratively with the Department of Juvenile Justice. You can see an in-depth interview with Janet Oliva this Sunday on Georgia Week in Review at 1 p.m. Well, Wednesday was CASA and Foster Youth Day at the Capitol. CASAs, or court-appointed special advocates, and their supporters gathered to encourage Georgians to volunteer to make a difference in the lives of abused or neglected children. CASA, a nonprofit advocacy group for abused and neglected children, met at the Capitol Wednesday for an early morning press conference. First Lady Mary Perdue shared with the group the impact that CASA has on the lives of abused and neglected children in Georgia. That having a CASA volunteer involved in a child's life significantly reduces the amount of time that child spends in foster care. The press conference marked the kickoff of CASA's new media campaign that will work to raise awareness about abuse and neglect in Georgia. What we're trying to say, um, a couple of things. One is that 
there are a lot of abused and neglected kids around the state, and we want to make people aware of it. Two, we want to make people aware that we need their help. We need volunteers that we can come in and train as CASAs to go in and help these and advocate on behalf of the abused and neglected children. Many of those present for CASA Day were there to meet with legislators and to attend committee meetings concerning children's rights. We're here today at the Capitol to ensure that children's rights are brought before our government to ensure that they're being protected and we are so excited about the governor's new child protection package. Uh, we just say bravo uh, to our legislators and we're here to actually meet with our legislators. According to a recent study, 53% of children who are victims of abuse or neglect become juvenile delinquents. To help prevent this trend, CASA is urging the public to get involved. Reporting for Lawmakers, I'm Christy Moran. And now to back up a bit and get the story we missed earlier, legislation that would prohibit activities commonly referred to as payday lending passed the House Banks and Banking Committee yesterday, but with a Senate substitute that received heavy opposition from some Republican committee members, David Zelsky has the story. Line three on four. House Banks and Banking Committee Chairman Johnny Floyd dropped a substitute to Senate Bill 157 to prohibit payday lenders, primarily in areas near military bases. They are unregulated. No one has any place to go. We've issued cease and assist orders, and uh, they only close up, move down the street under a different name. And so, I mean, this will put a little teeth in there that we hope that we can clear it up some. If you want to talk about true consumerism, you got it right here. Representative Earl Earhart believes the payday loan companies should be allowed to continue their business, but under certain restrictions. Restrictions he believes companies that give industrial loans should follow as well. What this is all about is putting one segment of a loan industry out of business so that another segment who has more of the political power can benefit. Period. In the story, there's nothing to do with consumers in here. And that's okay if they want to do that, but I'm not going to support that. If he wishes to go ahead <coughs> and rewrite the Industrial Loan Act at a future time, I'd be willing to work with him on that. What Representative Earhart is doing is representing the industry. And the industry is, um, they've finally been forced up against a wall, and they're finally saying, we'll regulate ourselves, we'll regulate ourselves, let us regulate ourselves. It's too late for that. We need to get in and... Um, clean this business up, and that's what this bill can do. Several of the Earhart amendments were ruled out of order by Chairman Johnny Floyd, who said they're not trying to change the industrial loan policy. But Representative Earhart said that he will reintroduce these amendments when the bill hits the House floor. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm David Zelsky. Well, as we mentioned before, today was Tourism Day at the Capitol. That brought some unusual apparel into the Senate chamber. The model, Senator Jeff Mullis. Being the proud chairman of the Economic Development and Tourism Committee and knowing that their members are committed to tourism, I want to speak to you about tourism and let you know that I'm here to promote tourism. Tourism in Georgia is big business. The famous tourist attraction Rock City is in Walker County, Georgia, and that's where one would assume Senator Mullis buys his hats. <laughs> well, coming up tomorrow on Lawmakers, we'll have full coverage of tonight's basketball game in which the House Senate All-Stars have taken on retired NFL players. We'll have that story and much more tomorrow night on Lawmakers. And if you're wondering how to snake wires through an outside wall or how to plant a magnolia tree, then be sure to stay tuned for this old house that's coming up next on Georgia Public Broadcasting. That's our broadcast for the 10th Legislative Day of the Georgia General Assembly. I've seen Rock City. I'm Gerald Bryant. <laughs> I'm in Wandy Lawson. For all of us here at Lawmakers, good night.